I'd like to first thank the Chair, Dr. Radhika Kumar Swami, for a little eye-opening over the talk introduction. Thank you very much, nevertheless. It's quite flattering when you hear that. Um, but thank you so much for your gracious listen. Thank you for sharing today's evening. Um, I must just say it's a great honor to be here, to be there during this oration. And I thank the Neil Infantil Mutesla for having invited me actually for the second time. Uh, I came formally to perform here. And um, it's indeed an honor to be in the presence of all of you and just share with you some thoughts uh, that I have on the subject in hand. I'm a person from the world of art, a person from the world of sound. So the only way I view myself and the universe around us is through that. So everything and everything I say, in fact everything I think, comes from that experience that art is offered me. So it doesn't come from politi political uh, astuteness, historical knowledge, sociological insight, or any of those things. So my endeavor to engage with society has come primarily from art. So let me begin right there. Art and democracy, I think, are two very, very interesting creations. Both come from a willed action of the human mind. I know people would argue that art already exists in nature. But I would argue that point of view and said, who decided it was art? It was the human being who decided it was art. Art is a willed action. It happened consciously. When human beings wanted to create something, the question is why? Why did we need art? It didn't matter whether you were poor, it doesn't matter if you have money, it doesn't matter where in society you belong. Every section of society, from time immemorial, have engaged with the idea of art. And my understanding of the possibility of why this happened is art does something very interesting to all of us. It's not just about self-expression. I think sometimes we have just, in a way, constricted the idea of art to be self-expression. I think it's the ability of art to connect you Every individual, the artist, the viewer, the receiver, the singer, the listener, everybody, to an experience that is not situated within your own self identity. Every experience we have in life, every way we react to anything in life, is situated primarily in your own identity of who you are, where you are. But at times, occasionally, whether it's a painting, whether it's a film, whether it's a song, whether it's theatre, whether it is something you saw on a wall, we are removed from there and we are moved. And we feel for the experience. We have an experience that could be transformative. And that experience is collective. It's with people, it's with others. Nevertheless, to presume that the very existence of art in society means that a society is somehow more sensitive is the greatest fallacy. Because art and artists are after all made of human beings. So if you want art to really be transformative, you need art to be questioned. You need art to be challenged. You need art to be scrutinized. And you need the artist to engage in it. You need the listener to engage in it. I don't think democracy is very different. I think it's such a beautiful idea. Again, it's come up from our, our brains, our head to create a, a possibility, a possibility of a place, imaginary sometimes because we don't see it in reality, where everybody could engage in a discourse, where there's a sense of equity in the discourse, where equality is an idea that we create in the way we share ideas, where again, through the construction of democracy, it is not I who matter, but it is the experience of the everybody else that matters. A sense of democracy, I think, to me, is the ability to give you a chance to engage with people without being stuffed with yourself. So, in many ways, art and democracy are similar. And again, like art, democracy doesn't ensure anything. Just the idea of this beautiful thing 
this abstract concept, ideationally wonderful, we can write reams about it. In reality, it doesn't seem to happen. And I also think in reality, our failure doesn't happen most of the times. Because both of them are trapped with the belief that their very existence is itself a forward movement. And therefore, those in it believe democracy itself in its existence does something. No. It does very little. Therefore, the transformative nature of art or democracy are both very similar. And when we celebrate democracy, we should always remember we can't celebrate it in comparison to places where democracy doesn't exist. Because sometimes, even in India, we have this habit of doing recently, um, we heard a comment from a leading politician who somehow was, was saying that the fact that we have democracy makes us better than other countries in the neighborhood. I don't think that's the right way to look at democracy. The problem is, what is democracy in your own land? What are you doing with democracy in your own land? What are you doing with your own understanding of democracy in your own land? You have to challenge it on an everyday basis, just like an artist has to challenge art on an everyday basis. So therefore, to compare ourselves in that fashion completely destroys the idea of art as much as it destroys every democracy. And sometimes, unknowingly, both in art and in democracy, the beautiful does happen. Without our awareness, without us knowing, something beautiful happens. But what do we do? That's the interesting part. We rarely learn from that beautiful thing that has happened. We rather parade that beautiful thing that happens to say, this is what we are in generality. We don't learn from that moment when something special has happened, when that when we have captured the spirit of how we share people, how we share ideas, how we share cultures, how we share tunes, how we share dance, everything. But we use that to further segregate ourselves between people. The experience of art also hides its nuts and bolts and the process and the toughness that is there in the interior that needs to be worked at for art to actually happen. Transformative art needs to change means the artist needs to wake up. For democracy to make a difference, we the members of society need to engage, work, struggle, fight. And only then we can hope that we have a democracy that is in constant, constant movement. And here we come to this idea of the liberal. I may be wondering to myself, and maybe some people here, that everything I describe is the idea of the liberal. You know, we may be even patting ourselves in the back. I don't know whether we are in a kind of an echo room today, just talking to ourselves at some times. Um, and I think this is a kind of an echo chamber too. And we have to be honest to maybe say that. We will be patting ourselves in the back and say, oh, this is exactly what the liberal does. The liberal is always looking at this. The liberal is always epitomizing this spirit. This essence, this idea of being for the other, this is what we are. What is the Krishna talking about? I was wondering about it because I consider myself a liberal. But are we? Are we seriously that? I think that's what I would like to talk about. And I think I would at least personally like to admit that as a liberal, I do sit on a high horse. I do sit on a very judgmental horse of every other element in society. And hence remain blind many times the illiberal within or the liberal within somebody I have labeled as conservator. And in times like now, it's easier to start the conversation by pointing fingers. But I think it's more important, at least for myself, to wonder about where we are as an idea of the liberal. And why this idea of democracy, this idea of culture, is not something that we live every day. We live in very, very 
very deeply disturbing times, whether it's the United States of America, whether it's India, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's Myanmar, whether it's Europe, we, the liberals, feel threatened. And that threat is absolutely real. Therefore, it's important for us to reflect upon being liberal as it is to fight the various forms of bigotry that surround us. Unless we are able to discover the idea of the liberal itself, there is no way we can fight the bigotry. Because this is going to be cyclical, it will keep coming and going, and we keep saying, the other is wrong, the other is wrong, the other is wrong, without reflecting upon what went wrong. So why are we here? Why are we in a position where I have to even say the liberal vision challenge? I'll talk first from India. In India, I'm sure all of you are reading the media and you're reading what reports come from India. And if you look at the past, if you look at the last 70 years of independence, what has happened in that country? What happened in that country for us to be in a position that we are today? What were the liberals doing for 60, 65 years? What were we up to? What conversations were we having? Who were we listening to? Who were we talking to? And most importantly, what did we miss? And I think there is a few things that we did miss. The initial years of Indian independence and democracy, I think one had a lot of people who were part of the independence struggle, and they carried forward that spirit for a long time, and the euphoria of independence itself. And then we had the biggest bolt to our democracy, which was emergency. And post emergency, we had again a government, which you would call is from a centrist party, but then we have also had a government that was very, very authoritarian, very, very dictatorial in every construction that it was. But none of us at that point of time thought of it in that fashion. Most of the people celebrated it. And it went on, it went on. And we had, we floated, we floated, we floated. We did so many things that was marginalizing the minorities in India. It went on and on and on and on. And we completely forgot that we liberals had not engaged with these issues with the courage that we should have right through the times when liberals were in power, or so-called liberals were in power. We took it for granted that many of these things will happen by themselves, that they'll iron out themselves. I'm not saying voices were not raised. That would be completely erroneous. Voices were raised. Were constantly raised. But the problem is that they were not seriously taken forward as challenges to our democracy. Never did we think that was that our democracy was in, in actually danger when all these things were happening. We somehow believe that the democratic idea will iron out these things and we move on and on to the point where we are today when we are saying, do we have that strength anymore? Sri Lanka is a very different country in that sense. You had a very different history. You had a directly an ethnic conflict that everybody saw, all of you experienced. And for me to, and therefore for me to think that India ever experienced something like that in that scale is completely wrong. But let me just say this, that I have to be very careful because democratic India has not not done the right things to the Dalits of India. It has not done the right things to the Muslims of India. We cannot ignore the struggles of the Kashmiris living in Kashmir. We cannot ignore what is happening in Assam, what is happening in Manipur, what is happening with the tribals even today. And it's happening every day. It's happening on a daily basis. And this is not today or yesterday, it's a long story. So though we have very different histories. As an Indian, I cannot ignore that. Whether it is Sri Lanka or India, I think the greatest issue has been the fact that most of the things that we have done has been either because of electoral appeasement, force, 
or even worse, I think a lot of things that, that society, concerns that society has done, has been somehow in a sense of condescension, in the sense of saying, help, not in the sense of sharing, not in the sense of seeing equity between the people, between the haves and the have-nots. And often we hear the word negotiation. We never hear the word conversation. Everybody who talks about speaking to people, talk about negotiating. Talk about negotiating. How often have we, as members of civil society, actually conversed? Actually had conversations? And with whom have we conversed? Here too we have to think very, very hard. Because I think our conversations are limited many times to our perspective of what we believe should have been. And therefore, our conversations don't expand. Fear is a very important word in this context. Whether it is the majority or the minority in a country, it is fear that governs how both sides, I'm buying, making a binary over here, but just for explanation, both sides deal with anything. Is either fear of being oppressed or the fear that if I allow the other to grow, I will be oppressed tomorrow. So fear and oppression are something everybody feels, whether we agree with it or not, whether we stand on the other side of that opinion or not. We can't forget that it is fear that dictates most of the ways these negotiations take place. So unless we are able to actually look at that as an unshakable element of any conversations that liberals or otherwise people have, we will not be able to actually move the conversation of democracy. And we will not be able to address divisions. So even if you put music and dance in five places, you create conversations through music or dance. Unless you address the inherent unevenness in that conversation, and unless you address the inherent fear on both sides of the people who are having that conversation, there is no way that conversation is not going anywhere. Because as much as the receiver, or the musician, or civil society, you are all only going to take that section of what you heard. And the rest will be a favor, and will be completely drenched again in condescension. I'll just give you a personal musical example of this. Um, but Pradhika was very kind to talk about the little work that uh, transgenders and I are trying to do. And I want to talk about how uneven it is. So this is a community called the Jogapas. They are a musical community living in the border areas of Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Maharashtra. And uh, a few years ago, through a, through a friend, we began what you would call a musical conversation. And um, it's been, for any, if not anything for me, it's been one of the most enriching experiences of my life. First, it challenged my notions on sexuality. Uh, to intellectualize the idea of sexuality is different than to share it in space and art and be with. And therefore, intellectually, I had no problems. It, it's all worked. It works, the, it works for the liberal mindset, doesn't it? to say that you believe in multiple sexualities. But then, when you're actually engaging in something, it's a completely different ballgame. So for me, it was also an important point in my life, because the only way I had seen transgenders in my life was in traffic signals. I had not met them anywhere else. And we start this conversation. It's a musical conversation. They have an incredible history of music, a tradition, and uh, we perform together. I won't go into the details of what we perform. But therein lies the problem. That how much ever we curate, we sit together, we discuss the fact that this is an uneven conversation, and do everything under our power to make it even, it still remains uneven. I am still the person with power. I sing a concert. The audience will not come if it's only the Jogopasini. They come because it's the Krishna and the Pasini. How does How do I deal with this? How does one handle the situation? So am I in some way, as somebody, somebody else also said, 
in a way further emphasizing the disparity in this conversation. How do I make sure that the disparity is not further emphasized? Can I ever do that? So, why I said this is primarily because it makes every sense to the liberal mindset. But the problem is in the engagement, it is still complex. And unless I am able to come face to face with the complexity of that, and with the fear that I have, and the fear that the Jogopas have, and the fear that the audience has, and the fear that all of us have, there is no way this conversation will mean anything. And if you look at society, you know, there are those people, they have been in India, I can tell you. Many of those people who are in between, who are in between in their thoughts of religion, in between on their ideas of culture, in between on their ideas of aesthetics, ideas of, of where they belong. And most of them, we liberals have allowed to move to an extreme conservative position. We allowed that to happen. It didn't happen automatically. And here I must talk about the majority middle class. And I think majority middle class is an issue that universally around the globe we are facing. Because that's one group of people, majority community of a country, belonging to the middle class, has been one group that the liberal intelligentsia have rarely addressed, have rarely bothered about, have rarely thought that that is an important set of people we should speak to. Because we have not spoken to them, you see what is happening. And also when we speak to them, we do not believe that their position is a liberal position. We have presumed that the conservatism in them makes it impossible for them to understand the liberal discourse. And therefore, they have, in a way, been suppressed in their thought. And now, you see it exploding. And I'm just saying that there is an onus that we also need to take as individuals for that happening. And it's not just about somebody taking away somebody's thought or thinking. Those who have tried to address that community, those who have addressed multiple communities, many times they have been either marginalized, in some cases even eliminated from the discourse, or physically eliminated from their existence, because they were trying to create that bridge that was most essentially required in these conversations. The question that I am primarily asking all of us is, how much baggage do we have in this room on our shoulders? How much are we carrying on our backs so as to be careful that when we speak about being liberal, we do not forget that we also are carrying multiple baggages that stains the idea of the liberal. India today. We live in India where, without doubt, there is an emphasis on making it what is commonly known as a Hindu Rashtra, a Hindu country. There is a common discourse that that's the way this country should be. The idea of the republic is definitely under threat. There is distortion of our history happening on a regular basis. Some may be funny and we may read funny columns about it, but I don't think there's any humor in it because those are serious, serious issues that are happening. And we always forget that it is in the textbooks that the most dangerous things happen. And our textbooks are changing. Our textbooks are changing, saying things that make no sense, that are violent, that are disturbing, that are divisive. This is happening in India. If there's an ugly new nationalism, the minorities are being targeted. And I was saying, imagine that we live in a time that people read you thrashing a Muslim person and put it up on social media. And they think nothing will happen to them. That speaks volumes of where we are culturally. Of course, generalizations are always problematic, but this is happening all over the country. It's not happening in one state. It's happening to Dalits, it's happening to Muslims, and it's something that should concern all of us. And my own state of Tamil Nadu, voices are also being suppressed. That whether it is a battle against, especially battles against the big multinational companies, 
are always taken as anti-national. Anti-national is a buzzword now. People love to say that. Anything that is questioning is made anti-national. Sri Lanka is a very different, different, different scenario. <coughs> the war ended in 2009. The war began with what we saw from outside was definitely a chest thumping, trumpeting kind of signal of victory. And that is all that is that is what we saw from outside. And then here I must talk to you about how my engagement with Sri Lanka happened. So it was for the same Neelan Tinsalu Trust that I came to sing in 2010. And it was just after um, the war ended. I don't remember the theme of the festival then, uh, but I remember that uh, when Siti invited me, she wanted me to sing on something that would bring various communities together, Tamar Singhala and all that. And I remember I even sang a Singhala song, I don't remember it anymore. And after that concert, it was she who looked at me and said, I think you should travel to the northern provinces. It so happened that the Indian High Commissioner, Mr. Ashokanta, was there. And he looked at me and said, I said, yes, of course. He said, are you serious? I said, yes, I'm very serious. And that's when I first traveled in 2010 to the northern provinces. I was the first musician to India in 37 years for having come, gone to Yarpanam again. And uh, we went by road. And in all my travels as a musician, which is usually quite comfortable and fancy, and you just see the very, very nice things in life. Uh, I think that was the most important travel for me. Uh, traveling to Yarpana, Kimochi, Vavunia, and a detour to Nulekiba. Um, it was a time where I met people, spoke to them, went to the music college, met students, multiple conversations happening all over. And it was, I think, something that deeply affected me and influenced my thinking of art to a large extent. I still remember um, so one student or a teacher, I don't remember, at the Ramanathan school in, in Yarpan, who told me that they used to have dance classes and when there were the sirens for bombs, they just go to the shelter and come back after 45 minutes and dance. And I thought to myself, would I ever do that? And uh, I couldn't think of me doing it. And then you wonder, what does art mean to these people? Yes, it's identity. Yes, we know that. But there's something more. It was that way to feel something else. It was a way not just to express, but to experience. And after that journey for two years, we did a festival in Yarkon called Swanabha, where we brought artists from India. Uh, it, was, it was quite amazing. More than 5,000 people watching dancers and musicians. Over two days, electric like demonstrations. And that whole period of time, for me, I think, emphasized the idea of culture and society as being far more important in the way we talk about not just identity, but also about how you can experience something, and that experience itself becomes transformative. So from there, the question is, where is Sri Lanka today? What change was expected, or in other, other words, how was change viewed? Victory happened, what then happened to the people, what is happening to the people? The ones who have suffered through all this, and the ones who have suffered through all this come from all sections of society. So the emotional complexity of this issue of faith, of relevance, of identity, of is completely blurs everything else. So the question that I think is important to think about here is when we remember, whom do we remember? When we call for heroes, who are the heroes? If there was a victory, who won? And if there was not a victory, then where are we? The fact of the matter is that I wonder sometimes whether 
Sri Lanka is a little ahead of us, is India. Not just in terms of an ethnic conflict, in terms of where you're moving, in terms of as a, as a political being. That when change was needed, change came. Governments changed. But what were the reasons for the change? Did the change come from a need to have larger conversations? Did the change come from a need to address the fact that remembrance is far more complex? Did the change come from a need of the reality of the sheer unevenness that has existed and the fact that you need to engage in a way that is self-transformative? Only then something can happen. And why I say, I wonder whether Sri Lanka is a little ahead, and I'm not saying this in a very happy sense, is because I wonder whether tomorrow, four years from now, India will be in a position where it also needs to think in similar lines. Divisions in both our societies, whether it is India or whether it is Sri Lanka, based there, it could be based on caste, based on gender, there too, linguistic differences, here, linguistic, ethnic, are all still very, very existent and stratified and completely entrenched in the way we look at things. So, when we talk about change, when we talk about governments moving, we cannot discuss any forward movement in our social society, even as liberals, unless we come face to face with the fact that unless we are constantly addressing these unevennesses, nothing is really going to change. And here comes the other word, the word that we love to talk about constantly, and that is corruption. Whether it's India or Sri Lanka, we love to talk about corruption. But what is corruption? We have reduced corruption to a financial number. That society only recognizes corruption in its financial form. And of course, that is something we need to address. But far greater and far more dangerous is ethical corruption, which is rampant in our society. And it is the lack of any discussion on ethical corruption that is why we are where we are, why we are never going to address the fact that the minorities are where they are. Because society only looks at corruption. And that society wins that way. Politicians win that way. You need to just show an issue of political corruption. And that, of course, is the reason of change, for change. But every other corruption that is existent is forgotten, is undercover, is unseen. But that's the cause for, for financial corruption. Financial corruption is actually the end product of every other corrupt practice that is there in the way we live in our society. So when you, when we all move from one government to another, one administration to another, one set of leaders to another, actually nothing changes. Absolutely nothing changes. Simply because we only talk about this form of corruption. The things that are there in the system remain. Let's look at some of them. Patronage, nepotism, a dictatorial structure, hierarchical authority remains just the same irrespective of who is in government. And constructionally, we are a feudal society. Whether it's India or here, we are a feudal society. Therefore, every way we've created a democratic structure, feudalism is entrenched in it. And we live by that feudalism. The person who doesn't have the power believes that's how it should be. The person who has the power believes enforcing is the way forward. And therefore, unless, therefore we may talk hundred times about removing corruption, but unless we talk about this, we're not going to do anything. So we all nod in agreement now, saying that, yes, this is important. But let's, let's, let's speak about a few other things. Where does this kind of feudalism come from? Where does this kind of nepotism come from? All nepotism and patronage and all these structures have couch, are seated in the rather deeper social divisions ethnic, linguistic, gender, religious, caste, all these discriminative practices are put into processes called nepotism, patronage, and all this. 
if you look at who, what kind of nepotism happens, what kind of patronage happens, you will see caste, you will see gender, you will see all social hierarchies reflecting themselves in the way these practices happen within the system. Therefore, we have to fight both systems together. We have to fight within the system and we have to fight the social organization. But democracy is hard, tiresome, difficult, very, 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 very problematic. Because I don't believe human beings are designed for democracy. If you just look at how human beings evolved, we are primarily what you could call pattern recognizers. So because we recognize patterns, is how we survive. You recognize patterns in the sky, you knew where to go. You recognize day and night, you recognize the sun and moon. So we are pattern recognizers. Gender is probably our first pattern recognition of male and female. So we are all pattern recognizers. So everything else, religion, ethnicity, linguistic differences, color, race, are all pattern recognitions. And every one of this is in a way against the spirit of democracy. So democracy challenges the fundamental nature of the human being. And the moment you have pattern recognition, you also have the one who has power, one does not have power. Which means controlling and keeping under control is also something we are designed. I'm not justifying the design, by the way. But we are designed. Which is why democracy becomes so important. That that design is itself constantly challenged. Which means it's very hard work. Which means every one of us has to challenge that design. Every one of us has to work on an everyday basis and allow democracy to challenge it. But all this comes down to ultimately not how we think, what we speak, but how we feel. Being a musician, I'm somewhat convinced that the best way people can change is not by understanding what is being said, but by feeling what is being said. Because I've met very few people who have changed because they understood an idea. Most people have changed because they felt something here. Something moved them. The idea also could move them, but it has to be felt, not understood. So, whether it is art, or whether we want to engage as people in democracy, we have to feel it. Whether it is Sri Lanka or whether it is India, if we want conversations to happen, if we want us to address the inherent inequality in the idea of negotiation, then we have to feel it. We have to be moved. We have to, we have to cry. We have to laugh. And that's not easy. Because all of us come with baggage. I'll tell you another very interesting thing. I've spoken to many liberals. And we'll be having a conversation on politics, on society, on gender, on caste, on various issues, on the ethnic conflict here. And intellectually, everybody is on board. Everybody agrees. We may have minor differences on how things should happen, but we all agree. And then we'll come to the subject of aesthetics. There's something interesting happens. Fascinating. Aesthetics, beauty of two art forms that belong to the unevenness. One closer to the liberal, who's probably part of a majority cultural framework, <coughs> and the other which they have experienced belonging to a marginalized community. Intellectually and socially, they will say, of course, you need to help them. We need to talk about their art form. We need that in the mainstream. We need people talking about it. Then there will be a but, after a pause. But aesthetically, you know, somehow, that's not the same as this. And I've always wondered about that. I said, okay, why do you feel it's not? No, but somehow, I know it's, it's beautiful, but it's not so evolved or sophisticated as, you know, the form that I go to, the concerts I go to, I hear Carnatic music or Hindustani music or whatever it may be. And you wonder where that's coming from. It's come from the inability of even the liberal to debaggage herself or himself to experience something. It's so hard to feel that the cultural 
you are unable to take away your habituation to actually jump into another aesthetic art form, cultural form. And unless you are free of what you have, you can't experience something else. And my own experience comes from here. The first time I saw what is kutu, some people call it ter kutu or kate kutu, and I've said this many times, I had no connection with it. Politically and socially, it made a lot of sense to me. Yeah. That is because I was already judging it. I was sitting on my aesthetic high horse and I was listening, viewing, judging, everything already what I knew. It took me so many times to re engage with the, with the art form when one day at 2 a.m., when I was watching these young students perform a kutu, something profound happened. For half an hour, I suddenly realized that I was experiencing a different culture. But at that point, there was no, I was not, it was not a different culture, it was just a culture. The point I'm making is, the liberals also suffer from this inability. We all suffer from this inability of a certain level of snootiness culturally and aesthetic. Something we should think about. And the word that comes to my mind in this context is a word that is rarely used in the world of, world of arts, but is often used in society, is the word empathy. What does it really mean? A friend of mine said, to identify oneself in a flight to solidarity is empathy. That was what beautifully put. It's merging, it's becoming. But do we merge? Do we become? We engage. But we don't become. We don't merge. So unless you're able to merge, become, where is there a conversation actually happening? There is only a negotiation happening. And in that negotiation, you are the powerful. Let's not forget that. You are the person who has the power to decide on that negotiation. So empathy, why we talk about empathy so many times? Empathy is very, very difficult. Empathy is very hard. It's not easy at all. And I think that's where it begins. That's where this conversation begins. And to be moved without the self-involved. And I spoke about that right in the beginning when I spoke about art. I also spoke about democracy. That at times you can be moved without the self. And democracy can move you. And that's empathy. But the thing is, it can't be an accident. It can't happen occasionally by mistake. It has to happen because we build a society that allows us to question ourselves. And it is from this experience, not this understanding, that the idea of dharma, which the Buddha so beautifully spoke about, comes about. Again, dharma is not, not an accident. It's a very, very thought out idea, but it comes from the experience of empathy. For some, dharma may be a code and order, a kind of adherence, even a dictum. But actually, it's just the opposite. It's being free of all this it's being free of control, an act of acute consciousness, which I would say is a result of empathy. When you feel empathy and when you believe that's the way we have to build societies, then dharma happens. We don't have to construct a dharma. We don't have to control the dharma. We don't have to organize it and give it rule books. It happens. And it is from this dharma, and I think the essence is the dharma that the liberal hopefully emerges. But I think it's a dharma that we are all seeking. And it's a dharma that we all should remember we do not have. And I would like to take ism out of this, not liberalism, but the liberal. Isms are, as all isms are problems, any ism. They're all problematic. And very soon, they become a rule, they become an order, 
the liberalist, the person within liberalism is also a hardliner. So there's no difference once you solidify it, once you create a crusty institution out of it, then it's lost. Liberalism may have an opposite in conservatism, but the liberal does not have an opposite. The liberal is a spirit. The liberal is a possibility. It doesn't achieve a target. It doesn't have a goal. It's a state and it is within. The state of being a liberal is within. It's within ourselves. It's a constant battle and a struggle. It does not exist in the future where you go and meet an end. It happens now here. A critically conscious, questioning, introspective mind. We presume somehow that we have it. And therefore, most of the times when you have a liberal discourse, it's always about what the outside does not have. It's always about what is missing in the non-liberal discourse. But I think a lot of that is also missing in the liberal discourse itself. And hence, since it is not crusted in organization, it is not belonging to a specific body, the liberal has home everywhere. It doesn't matter where it exists, in every subdivision, in every religious order, in every social spectrum, the liberal can exist. And this liberal is not an outward-looking liberal, but an inward-looking liberal. It is the inward-looking liberal that will make sure our society has ethi is ethically uncorrupt. It's the inward-looking liberal that will make sure that any conversation that happens between people in uneven situations in society is truly a conversation. It's the inward-looking liberal that will see that if you want Political constructions to change, you have to change from basic social orders. We cannot make any change if you don't change the social cultural constructions. The liberal is traditionally seen as being somebody who accepts and somebody who respects others, others' opinions, others' behaviors. But I think it is, like I said, a person who is extremely vigilant about one's own idea and one's own faith. When we remain that way, then we don't only point fingers the other way. We also constantly, in fact probably more often, point fingers at ourselves. But let me not make a cardinal mistake of implying somehow that this is some kind of an intellectual, educated idea. And this is something I found again in my travels. That the idea of the liberal, the idea of the free mind, the free heart, not the mind, the free heart, is far more awake in everyday happenings in people's life who will not be able to articulate it to you, who will not be talk to you about the idea of the liberal or the conservator. In fact, they don't understand the difference between the two. Whether it is a farmer, whether it is an artist, especially artists of, of communities that are marginalized, I've seen that far more in them than from artists who belong to what is known as high art, unfortunately known as high art. And I've seen that it's there that you see the kind of sharing, you kind of see the liberal spirit, you kind of see the ability to move the people emotionally, to feel for people, to realize that every other construction is, is, a, is, a, is a construction that comes from judgment. And they can able to do it so easily. So when we talk about the past of our communities to stay together, I think we should talk about the fact that all those communities are extremely liberal communities. You know, we rarely use that word in that context. We always say that they were women, they were all together, they shared space. I think the fact is that liberal lived within them. And I think the core to this is something that is close to my feet, which is music, and that is listening. And I think that's the most useful word. There's so much difference between hearing and listening. We all hear, we rarely listen. 
when we hear, I give an example in my classroom. I'm, I'm going back and forth from music because there's many, many examples there. So the three students of mine, rather, one student that day, and I was singing a phrase and I asked the student to repeat it. First time, I did not get the phrase. Second time, I did not get the phrase. This went on 15 times, 20 times. And this is a very good student, very, very talented, but just did not sing the phrase. And I was getting frustrated and in class I had a very, very angry version of my, myself. And I was almost screaming and saying, what are you doing? And then it struck me, the problem was very simple. Every time I began singing, the student was already singing in her head. So who was the student listening to? I start a phrase, I start singing it, your mind already maps it. It already gives a trajectory to it. And because you know music, and you listen to yourself, my student was listening to her own voice. She was not listening to my voice, she was hearing. And she was hearing her own voice. I was not a present. So then I said, stop. Now shut your brain for just two minutes and actually listen to me. And within two, two renditions, she had sung it. How many times are our conversations exactly this? How many times when we actually hear, we actually try to listen to somebody, are we actually hearing our own brain, our own voice, our own words? Most of the times. We don't listen. And I think listening is one of the most beautiful things that we have, but we do not exercise, and I think the liberal is one who listens. We are here today celebrating, I think, a person who listened. I think when we speak of meaning to each other, we're speaking of a person who listened. The fluidity in his life as a human being came from this ability to listen to all voices. I think it also included the hidden ones within himself. He was probably, that was probably in fact the more important thing. Because there are hidden voices within ourselves that we don't listen to. We hide it, we bury it, we put it in the inmost inner reaches of our head. Until one day it explodes and we don't know how to deal with it. I think it is this ability to listen within and around that allowed him to straddle so many things. Constitution, activism, the abstract, the very specific, the larger canvas, the ideation, local, national, international, it doesn't matter. Because the moment you listen, all this is disappears. You can engage with it in different ways. You can engage with it on ground, conceptually, <coughs> culturally, because they don't really matter. These are divisions that we create. And I think all these limitations and boxes completely are broken down. That is the state of the liberal. The state of the liberal is when this is possible. When this kind of profoundness, actually, it's, it's, it's just very special profoundness, is possible in the way we exist. So when we speak about Sri Lanka and its own struggles with and post the ethnic conflict. And when we speak of India and its struggles with religious bigotry, with casteism, I think we need many people like Neil and Tilchilum who listen. And I think the liberal world needs to learn to listen. And I think the more and more we listen, I think the more and more you'll have people participating in that collective listening. That collective contestation of listening. Listening is not necessarily very pleasurable. But that contestation of listening, that whole idea that only if we listen can something happen. And only when we listen are we not condescending. And only when we listen can we debaggage our own 
loads that we carry sometimes for generations. I'm not saying that such people don't exist today. That would be completely wrong. I think there are people across the world, in this country, in India, students, people within the system, NGOs, not to forget the press, who are all, I think, pushing and prodding towards this possibility. But my, why I'm saying all this is because if we want the liberal not to be confined to these individuals, and if you want the liberal to be transformative, if you want change to happen in governance, if you want change to happen in addressing issues of reconciliation, and if we want in India change to happen in addressing issues of religious bigotry, we need the spirit to be set free. We have to set it free within ourselves. And it also needs to be set free from people who we believe don't even have it. That's the bigger mistake. Because I think many people have it. How are we going to set it free within ourselves and in society? So it doesn't matter what belief system they come from, it doesn't matter what color they are, nothing matters. And I think if we can engage with these wonderful people who are on the road today and set the liberal from its spines, allow it to fly, fly free, then no border can limit its flight. Until then, we are still searching to be liberals. We are still hoping to be liberals. The question is, are we willing to put ourselves through that task of freeing the liberal? Or are we going to believe that liberal is also a construction. The challenge for the liberal is not only coming from the outside. I think the challenge for the liberal is within. I'm going to actually end with a song. Um, do I have time? And this song is something I sang at the Leland Literature Trust when I came in 2010. I didn't plan to sing it till I just left my hotel room because it's connected to what I ended with. This song, of course, can be interpreted like any song in how many different ways that you want. It can be interpreted, and it is probably directly about the borders that we create between people, between communities, between uh, religions, between everybody, gender, everything. But it's also about the fact that the liberal spirit, for me, does not have boundaries. It can't be controlled by anything. It can't be controlled by all these constructions. But the onus is on us as individuals to let it go free. So this song is a song which creates a borderless environment. This song asks questions most people know Tamil here, I don't know many people don't know Tamil, so I'm going to try and give you probably a little meaning of it. So the song is... So rivers flow from countries to countries. Has a land to land, has land ever stolen a river? Is the first half graph. The second is... There is a fence between two lands. Has anybody arrested the wind for having travelled across the fence? Third paragraph. There are two villages, one slightly at a higher plain, the other one at a lower plain. So there's rain that is rain on the higher plane, higher reaches and come down, has any border being able to limit the rain from coming from there to here. <coughs> there are trees that grow in the borders. The roots go across those borders. Has anybody been able to stop the roots from growing across the borders? And it ends by saying, I hope that humankind will realize that there is no one way that every way is your way. <coughs> this is the song I'm going to sing. And to me, this epitomizes this, this 
spirit of the liver. To be able to swim, to be able to fly, to be able to flow, to be able to go beneath every, every segregation that we design in society. Whether the segregation is color, creed, whatever. The ability for the liberal to question their own limitations in these segregations and then from there hopefully get to a point where they can float and fly is I think the most beautiful idea. And this song epitomizes it. I'm going to render it for you. Didn't come back prepared, but nevertheless. Nadi vittu nadi nadi nadandu po narendra nadi vittu nadi nadi nadandu po narendra nadi kadathi yadunda nadi galai yavare num nadi vittu nadi nadi nadandu po narendra nadi kadathi yadunda. ನದಿಗಳೇಯವರೇನು ಸಮ ಪಾಪ ಸಮನಿದ ಮನಿದ ಸಲಭ ಸಮ ಪಾಪ ಸಮನಿದ ಮನಿದ ಸಲಭ ಸಮ ಸಪ ಸದ ಸನಿ ಸದ ಸುಮ ಪಮ ಸ ಸದ ಪಮ ವೇಟ್ರ ನಾಟ್ ಪಕ್ಕ ವೇರಿ ದಾಂಡಿಗ ಕಂಬೇರಿ ದಾಂಡಿಗ ದಂಡ್ರ ಕಾಟಿನಯಾರೇನು ಕೈದ ಸೇದ ಗುಂಡ ಸದನೆ ಸರಿಗಮ ಗಮಗಮ ಸದನೆ ಸರಿಗಮ ಗಮಗಮ ಗಮನಿದ ಗಮ ಸದಾನಿ ಸರಿದ ದನಿರಿ ಮದನಿ ಗಮದ ಎಲ್ಲ ಪುರಮರಂ ಮೇಲೂರಿಲ್ ಕೊಳಂದು ಬಿಟ್ಟ ಕೀರೂರಿಲ್ ಪೇಯವರಂ ಸೂರ್ ಮೇಘತೆ ಎಲ್ಲೈ ಸುವರ್ಗಳ್ ತಡುತ್ತದುಂಡ ಮೇಲೂರಿಲ್ ಕೊಳಂದು ಬಿಟ್ಟ ಕೀರೂರಿಲ್ ಪೇಯವರಂ ಸೂರ್ ಮೇಘತೆ ಎಲ್ಲೈ ಸುವರ್ಗಳ್ ತಡುತ್ತದುಂಡ ಮರಗರಿ ಸಾಸನಿ ನೀರವ ದಸರಿಗ ಸದೀಪ ಮಲಗರಿ ಸಾರಿ ನೀರವ ದಸರಿಗ ಸದೀಪ ಗಮ ಪನಿದ ನಿಪದ ಮಪ ಮಲಗರಿ ಸನಿರವ ದಸರಿಗ ಮಲಗರಿ ಸಾರಿ ನೀರವ ದಸರಿಗ ಸದೀಪ ಗಮ ಪನಿದ ನಿಪದ ಮಪ ಮಲಗರಿ ಸನಿರವ ಮಪನಿದ ಎಲ್ಲೈ ಪುರಮ ರಂಗಳ್ ಅಂಡೈ ನಾಟ್ ನೀರ್ ಕುಡಿ ಬಿಲ್ಲಂಗಳ್ ಸೇದರೆಂದ್ರ ವೇಗಳ ಯಾವಟ್ ಗಿರುಂ ಎಲ್ಲೈ ಪುರಮ ರಂಗಳ್ ಅಂಡೈ ನಾಟ್ ನೀರ್ ಕುಡಿ ಬಿಲ್ಲಂಗಂ ಸೇದರೆಂದ್ರ ವೇಗಳ ಯಾವಟ್ ಗಿರುಂ ಸದನಿ ಪದ ಮಪರ ಮರಿಯ ಸರಿಗ ಮಪ ರಿಗ ಮಪರ ಮಪರ ನಿಸ ಎಂದಿಕ್ ಇದುವೆಂದ್ರ ಎನ್ನು ವರದೇನ್ಯನ್ ತೋಡ ಎಂದಿಕ್ ಇದುವಂದ್ ಎನ್ನು ವರದೇನ್ಯನ್ ತೋಡ ಎಂಗಿರಕ್ ಪೊದುವೆಂದ್ರ ಎಳುಚಿ ಕೊಳ್ ಎಳುದ ನಿಲ್ ಎಂದಿಕ್ ಇದುವೆಂದ್ರ ಎಣ್ಣು ವರದೇನ್ಯನ್ ತೋಡ ಎಂಗಿರಕ್ ಪೊದುವೆಂದ್ರ ಎಳುಚಿ ಕೊಳ್ ಎಳುದ ನಿಲ್ ಎಳುಚಿ
is a conversation in art about art and beyond art. And it's a conversation which is also articulated in the world. And where does the liberal lie? And where does the liberal go? And where the liberal finds herself or himself? Thank you very much.